Okay, so today we'll be discussing chapter nine of the book, uh, which is about uh, support uh, vector machines. Um, for the learning objectives, uh, we are going to be uh, looking at how we implement uh, a binary classification model uh, using a maximum uh, margin classifier. We are also going to look at the approach using support vector classifier and also soft support vector uh, machine. So at the end, we are going to see how we are going to generalize uh, support vector machine models to multi-class, to, multi, to handle multi-class uh, multi uh, cases. So, so that is uh, basically uh, uh, the learning objective. So for uh, in the book, uh, they kind of like say that they support a uh, vector machine is an approach for classification developed. It was developed in the 90s and support vector machine is a generalization of classifiers method in particular. And uh, we also see that uh, maximum margin classifier that it, it requires that the classes be separable by linear boundary. That is we need to be able to what, split those, uh, those classes uh, using a a linear boundary. Then we also see that support vector classif uh, support vector machine you handle what binary classification setting with two classes. So we need to have binary classes in order for us uh, to use uh, this approach, which is just similar to what we learned previously using the logistic uh, regression. So uh, here they also introduce uh, this uh, concept of a uh, of a hyperplane. Here we have a two-dimensional hyperplane. And um, this in, in the right, they were they will use an approach where they made use of a three-dimensional, uh, a three-dimensional hyperplane. So they said that the hyperplane is a P minus one dimensional flat sub surface, subspace of a P-dimensional space. For example, in a two-dimensional space, a hyperplane is a flat one-dimensional space that which is just like a line. And they, they also went further to define the two D and the three D space uh, using this equa this uh, this equation where they have beta zero plus beta one x one plus beta two x two plus beta three x three, which must be equals uh, to zero which must be equals to zero. And the, and the inner product, any of x, which is we have x1, x2 to the power of t, for which the equation above is satisfied, is a point on the hyperplane. I think there the were some additional uh, resources which was uh, uh, very useful in which the, the, the previous quotes, uh, they, they pinned some additional resources here about the deep, uh, AI uh, so yeah we, they were looking at the concept of uh, separating hyperplane so here we have two classes uh, we have this is uh, one class which is which is in blue we have also have another class uh, which is in purple so here we are having a three uh, uh, separating hyperplane. So we have the first, we have uh, the second, we have uh, the third. So we also implement the same concept in the right, where we have a separating hyperplane, one separating hyperplane, which is a thick black line. Uh, we have the first class, this is the second class. Then we are having some dotted line. Uh, and they, they said that the dotted line is just uh, the decision rule. Uh, uh, indicate the decision rule made by the classifier in which we use in splitting this. So we can see we have this class here. We also have another class here. Then we have a separating hyperplane. So they just say the dotted uh, line is just uh, the decision rule, which is uh, used uh, for the classifier. Uh, we can label the blue observation as yi is equals to what? One and the pink observation as yi is equals to what? Uh, minus, uh, is equals to minus uh, one. Thus, a separating hyperplane has the property of this, beta zero 
uh, plus beta p x p, which must be what greater than zero if y i is equals uh, to one, and if uh, y i and we also have beta zero plus beta one x one plus beta two x two plus beta p x p, which is less than zero if y i is less y i is equals to minus one. In other words, a separating hyperplane has the property, it has this uh, property where we have this equation, which is greater than zero and i is equals to from one to a value of what n. So we also consider the magnitude. If it is far from zero, we are confident in its classification. Whereas if it is close to zero, then x star raised to the power of star is located near the hyperplane. So this uh, is just about uh, separating hyperplane. So I don't know. Uh, okay. So Connor, you are welcome. I don't know if there are any comments before we proceed into into the next part. No, I'm good. Okay, thank you. So here is just about uh, the maxima, the maxima margin uh, classifier. So this is the same. We have our this another class. This another class. We have a thick line which is uh, which stands for the uh, the separating hyperplane. So we also have uh, uh, wait, the margin is the distance from the solid line. So I think the distance from this solid line to this dotted line is the what they call the margin. Uh, then the the support vector is just this thick blue these blue circles and this uh, purple circles. They said that that is a support vector. Then they dotted the this dotted line. I think it's gonna be uh, the decision rule from uh, this classifier, just as we see uh, in the previous uh, slide. This. So they said generally, if the data can be perfectly separated using a hyperplane, in an infinite amount of such hyperplanes exist. An intuitive choice is a maxima margin hyperplane, which is a hyperplane that is farthest from the training data. So we compute the perpendicular distance from each training observation to the hyperplane. The smallest of these distances is known as the margin. So the maxima margin hyperplane is the hyperplane for which the margin is maximized. We can classify a test observation based on which side of the maxima margin hyperplane it lies on. And this is known as the, as the maxima margin classifier. So the maximum margin classifier, which is X based on the sign F of X is equals uh, to this equation, which is also uh, given uh, using this uh, figure, okay? Which is similar to what we have uh, here. Okay. So the mathematics uh, here, they just talk about uh, the mathematics of the maxima margin classifier. So cons we consider constructing an MMC base on the training observation of X1 to Xn. This is the solution to optimization problem. So, and they gave us this equation, so which is also giving us this. So where M is the margin and beta coefficients are choosing to maximize M. So the constraint, which is the third equation, ensure that each observation will correctly, will co correctly classify as long as M is, as long as M is positive. So we, we have one group. We also have another group here. We have our hyperplane here. So we have the, uh, we have the support vector. So we are also see that the blue points and the purple points that lie on the dashed lines are the support vectors and the distance from those points to the hyperplane is indicated by arrows. The distance to the hyperplane, is the, the purple and the blue grid indicate the decision rule made by the classifier based on this separating uh, hyperplane. 
So I think they also showed another example. Uh, they also show another example where we also have two classes of this data, but we we can see that using this approach, it becomes very difficult uh, for us uh, to use a, a hyperplane to, to split them into what two classes, because here we have also have another observation here. So we also have another, so it's gonna be very difficult. Uh, the separating hyperplane uh, will not do a, a good job in this uh, case. So in this other case here, uh, we can see we can use the approach of separating hyperplane to split this data into two different class. Okay, so in this other setting here, they added an additional data point. Okay, so this was the original point, okay, where we did not have additional blue dots, data points. So, but when we added an additional data points, it lived to us having a new separating hyperplane. So in order for us to capture that, so they need to have a new uh, separating hyperplane, which is this thick uh, black line in order for us to split this data into, into the two uh, different classes. So here they were talking about uh, support vector classifiers, support vector classifiers. So, so we, we can't always use a hyperplane to separate uh, two classes. So even if such a classifier does exist, it is not always desirable due to the overfitting or too much sensitivity to individual observations. So thus, it might be worthwhile to consider a classifier or a upper plane that misclassifies a few observations in order to improve classification of the training data points. So they said that the support vector classifier, the soft margin classifier allows some training data to be on the wrong side of the margin or even the hyperplane. So they look at the mathematics of the SV support vector classifier, which is, uh, which is also uh, giving us uh, this. So, so that is, was the mathematics uh, of the support vector classifier where they have C is a non-negative tuning, it's a non-negative tuning parameter typically chosen through cross uh, validation and can, can be thought of as the budget for margin violation by the observations. So we, they also say that the EI are slack variables that allow individual observations uh, to be on the wrong side of the margin or hyperplane. The EI indicate where the height observation is located with regards to the margin and and hyperplane. If the AI is equals to zero, the observation is on the wrong correct side of the margin. So the observation is going to fall on the correct side of the margin. But if the AI is greater than zero, the observation is on the wrong side of the margin. So also if AI is greater than one, the observation is on the wrong side of the hyperplane. So since C constrains the sum of the AI, it determines the number and magnitude of violations to the margin. If C is equals to zero, there is no margin for violation. Thus, all the EI to, to what EN is equals to what zero. Note that if C is greater than zero, no more than C observation can be on the wrong side of the hyperplane. Since these cases, EI is, is always is greater than is greater than one. So that is just the mathematics of the support vector uh, classifier. So now the tuning parameter, because we need to tune it to get the best model out. So the, for the tuning parameter, so they just uh, made use of uh, these four uh, data sets. So they said the support vector classifier was fit using four different values of the tuning parameter C in from 9.12 to 9.15. So the largest value of C was used in the top left panel. So the top left panel, which is uh, this, we use, made use of the largest value of uh, C. Uh, 
and the smallest uh, smaller values were used in the top right, bottom left, and bottom right panel when C is large. Okay, when C is large, then there is a high tolerance for observations being on the wrong side of the margin. And so the margin will be large as C decreases, the tolerance for observations being on the wrong side of the margin decreases and the margin narrows. So here we also see that a property of the classifier is that only data points which lie on or violate the margin will affect the hyperplane. These data points are known as the support, uh, they are the support vectors. So C controls the bias variance trade-off of the classifier. When C, when C is large, we have high bar bias and low variance. But when C is small, we have low bias and high variance. So the, the property of the support vector classifier solely being dependent on certain observation in classification differs from other classification methods such as the linear discriminant uh, analysis, which depends on mean of all observation in each class as well as each class covariance metrics using all observations. So however, they also say our logistic regression is more similar to the support vector classifier in that it has low sensitivity to observations far from the decision uh, boundary. So we, can, we have seen that the logistic regression is more close similar to the SVC approach. So this is just a nonlinear classification. So they were giving us the, the mathematic, mathematics uh, behind uh, the nonlinear classification. Here we see that many decision boundary are not uh, linear. So we call fit and SVC to the data using two P futures. In the case of P futures, and using a quadratic form. So given by uh, this equation. So, so we should, they also mentioned that we should note that in the enlarged future space here with the quadratic terms, the decision boundary is linear. But in the original future space, it is quadratic in this example. And generally, the solution are not linear. So once one could also include interaction terms, higher degree polynomials, and thus the future space could enlarge quickly and entail unmanageable uh, computations. So yeah, we, they were talking about uh, support uh, vector machines. So that they say that the SVM is an extension of the SVC, the support vector classifier, which results from using kernels to enlarge fu the future space. So they say that a kernel is a function that quantifies the similarity of two data points. So the kernel, uh, quantifies the similarities uh, of the two data point. Essentially, we want to enlarge the future space to make use of nonlinear decision boundary. So while avoiding getting bogged down in unmanageable calculations, the solution to the SVC problem in the SVM context involves only the inner product of the observations. So here we have uh, we have the, the equation for the support vector machine in context SVM. The linear support vector classifier is as follows, which goes as these equations. So to estimate n alpha of i coefficients and beta zero, we we only need uh, inner product between between all pairs of training observations. So we should, they also say we should note that in the equation above. In order to compute f of x for new points x, we need the inner product between the new points and all the training observation. However, alpha i is equals to zero for all points that are not on the uh, on or within the margin. That is points that are not support vectors. So we can rewrite the equation as follows, where s is a set of supports points indices 
which is given us uh, this equation. So we replace every inner product where k is a kernel function. So, so the SVC uh, is known as a linear kernel since it is linear in the futures. So one, we could also have a kernel functions of the following form, which is uh, which is given as uh, as this uh, this equation. So this will lead to a much more flexible decision boundary, and is basically fitting an SVC in a higher dimensional space involving polynomials of degree D instead of the original future space. So when an SVC is combined with a nonlinear kernel as above, the result is a support vector uh, machine, which is uh, given as, uh, which is given as F of X is equals to beta uh, zero plus summation of alpha I K into X and X I. So which is the support vector machine uh, equation. So here they were also introducing the concept of using uh, the radial uh, radial kernel. So which is just going to be something like this uh, image show. So there are other options besides polynomial kernel function. And a popular one is the radial uh, kernel, which is given uh, as this equation. For a given test observation, OK, if it is far from this, then k will be small, given the negative uh, lambda and a large this. So thus, x of i will play a little role in f of x. So the predicted class for x is based on the sign of f of x. So training observations far from a given test point play little part in determining the label, label for a test uh, observation. So the radial kernel therefore exhibit local behavior with respect to other uh, to other observations uh, in which we have in the data. So we have the support vector machine with the radial kernel. So we we are trying to see how we are going to compare. So this one is support vector machine using uh, the polynomial kernel. So this one is also using the radial the radial kernel. So here we can see that SVM polynomial kernel of degree three is applied to the nonlinear data from figure 9.8, which is shown uh, resulting in a far more appropriate decision rule. So for the right, we are using SVM with a radial kernel is applied. In this example, either kernel is capable of capturing the, the decision uh, boundary. So I'm sorry, I have, let me, So sorry for that. Uh, so the advantage of using a kernel rather than simply enlarging future space is computational since it is only necessary to capture kernel functions. So for radial kernels, the future space is implicit and infinite dimensional. So we could not do the computations in such a space anyways. So. So when we have more than two classes, so, so the concept of separating hyperplane does not extend naturally to more than two classes, but there are some ways around this. So one, a one versus one approach constructs SVM where K is number of classes and observations is classified to each of the K class, K of two classes and the number of times it appears in each class is counted. The Kth class might be coded as plus one versus the Kth class is coded, coded as uh, minus one. So the data point is classified to the class for which it was most often assigned in the pairwise uh, classifications. So another option is one versus all classification. This can be useful when there are a lot of classes. So in this case, we have K of SVM are fitted and one of k classes to the remaining k minus one classes. So we have we have uh, beta zero of k 
to beta p of k denotes the parameters that result from constructing an SVM comparing the k class coded as plus one to the other class of uh, minus one. So we then assign test observation to the class of k for which uh, this is uh, the largest, that is beta zero plus to beta p of k or x of p is, the, uh, is giving us uh, the largest uh, value. So this was just the lab for support vector where they were trying to use uh, the tidy models approach. So here we have, uh, we just set a random seed. Then we have a simulated data, which is a matrix, our norm. So we have with great 20 random number, we just multiply it by two. So we have number of columns. So we have been two column. So the dimension names, which is a list, we have null, we have X1 and X2. And then we convert everything to be a tables and then we mutate where we repeat minus one 10 times. We also repeat one 10 times. So, and then we mutate X1, if else, Y is equals to one, it should be X1 plus one. Otherwise it should be X1. Uh, one. So we also have x2, if else y is equals to one, it should be x2 plus one, otherwise it should be x2. So we also have, we now use this simulated data uh, to create our uh, visualization, to create, to check for the hyperplane. So here we can see that uh, we have our x1, we also have our X2, where we have our uh, Y, which is where we have minus one. We also have it as one. So we just visualize to have this using GG plus. So here they have, they loaded the test data. So they, from the test data, they're also trying to make the hyperplane, okay? So uh, we also have, uh, we also have this, so which shows that we have two classes. We have the red, we also have uh, the uh, the blue. So then we create a spec, a model, which will update throughout this lab with with different costs. So we have here we are having SVM poly, so which is a polynomial of degree one, and then we set mode to be classification, set engine to can lab. We then we set the scale to false. Then we then do a couple of a couple with most uh, with manual costs. So we have SVM linear spec, and then they set the argument to where the cost is equals to, uh, to 10, and then they fit the model. So we have the SVM linear fit 10 to begin, which is a passing model object, support vector machine object of class, KSVM. Uh, we have the cost, which is equals to, uh, to 10. Then, then we have the polynomial, uh, kernel function, we have hyperparameter degree is one, scale is also one, and offset is one, and the number of support vectors is equals to what, seven. So here we just extract the fitted model from the engine, so, and then we then do, we then do our plots, which is gonna result uh, in this output. So here we have the scale, so here we are going from minus uh, one to down to my, from minus three to minus one, we have zero. So all here we have positive, so we can see. So here we have the, we have, they have the FDM spec and then they set the argument where the cost, they just re, they reduce the cost to 0 0.1 and then they fit the model. So when the cost is 0 0.1, they had this model, so, here we can see that when the cost, when we reduce the cost, uh, we can see that the number of support vector increased to from to 16. So mm -hmm. the object function value is now this, then the training error is now 0 0.05, and the probability model is also included. So when we draw the plots uh, from this fit, so we are going to have uh, this, as the as the final output. So we also have the SVM linear spec, and then we set the argument where the cost is now 0 0.01, then we fit uh, the model. 
So when we fit the model, we can see that uh, the more we reduce the cost, we can see that the more number of, uh, the, the more the support vector keep on increasing. So now we are now having from 16, we have now at the support vector is now 20. So when we now extract the fit third engine from that uh, model, and then we now do our plots. So we are going to have this as our final output. So now the tuning parameter. So let's uh, find the best cost. So for, for us to do that, we need to, we need to set our workflow and then we had our model, which is the SVM linear spec. And then we set our argument where the cost. So here we are using hyperparameter tuning. So we do not set any default value. We want uh, to tune it to get the best cost. So, and then we are adding the formula. Then we here we set the seed. Then this is for the simulated data fold. Here we are using cross validation. Here we say the simulated data where the strata is equals to Y. Then grid, uh, grid regular where we call the cost, then the levels is equals to what, 10. So, which is, this is the 10 values for we move from 0 0.00977, then we move uh, down to what, 32. So here we are using the tune grid function. We are passing the sub SVM linear uh, workflow. Then we, we samples, there we say, should be sim simulated data fold. Then the grid is called to what, param, param grid. So here we are now using the auto auto plot uh, function on the tune rest. The, so tune can pull out the best result for us. So here we use the select best from the tune rest, then the metrics should be accuracy. So, so we also have the, uh, we also have the SVM linear final. So we have to finalize the workflow. So we have the SVM linear fit, SVM linear final, and then we fit on the simulated uh, data. So, so we now have SVM linear fits, and then we have to augment new data. We pass in the test data and then confusion matrix where the truth is equals to Y and the estimate is predicted class. So when we do this, we can now see the uh, confusion matrix where we have the truth and also the prediction. Here we have minus one and one. Here we have minus one and one. So in this case, we have nine uh, as against a uh, one. Here we are making the truth with two, Why uh, the actual was, uh, we also have two and also eight. So for the accuracy, so to, for us to know how accurate is our prediction, so we are having nine, which is nine plus plus uh plus eight all over all over nine plus uh one plus two plus eight. So when we add this value divided by this, so we have a value of 0 0.85. So we have 85% accurate. So we have to see that SVM fits. And then we augment new data. We pass in the test data, then confusion metrics. So here we have the predicted class. So this is uh, this is the output. So when we now check uh, the the accuracy, so here we are seeing that we are seventy percent uh, accurate. So here they were looking at the linearly separable data. So here we have simulated data. And then we are creating a new column, which is X1 and X2, where X1 is going to be if else, where Y is equals to 1, should be X1 plus 0 0.5. Otherwise, it should be X1. So here we are having where Y is equals to 1, it should be X2 plus 0 0.5. Otherwise, we leave everything as X2. So that is our simulated uh, data. So we can use it uh, to, to visualize. So once we visualize it, so we can see that we have we have uh, this uh, we have these two classes of, of so when we now use the the SVM linear spec and then we set the argument where the cost was now one we reduce the cost significantly then we fit uh, the model so here we can see that uh, when we reduce the cost 
here we are, can see that the number of support vector is equals uh, to three. So we are having three uh, support vector in this case. So when we now extract the fit from that engine and then we, we plot it, so we are going to have, uh, we are going to have this uh, as our as our output. So when we now did the similar, where we say the cost is will be equals uh, to one. So when the cost is equals to one, we now fit it. So we can see that the number of support vector uh, was now seven. So we now extract our output and then we plot, then we, we are going to arrive at uh, this. So we, we also create on a new test uh, data by, spec by specifying uh, this, uh, these rules in which, so we, we now see that uh, when we now augment, so we pass in our new data, should be test data set, and then we look at the confusion metrics where the truth is equals to Y and the estimate is this. So we are going to have uh, this as our confusion metrics. So when we look at uh, the accuracy, it's just similar to what we have uh, initially which is our 0 .0 0 0.85, which is we are 85% accurate. So when we now check for the second, uh, when we now check for the second passing the new test data, so we can now see that we have uh, this. So we can see that here yeah, we are more on the high side, which is we are 90% uh, uh, accurate uh, in making a good uh, prediction. Uh, uh, from the model, so I think uh, I think that is just all I have uh, for that. It was the chapter, though it, we are the chapter was a bit challenging for me. Yeah, I've never used one of these in real life, so I'll have to find some more.